We are going to move on to our final keynote of this morning. Uh, Jonathan Ellis is joining us from uh, Datastack, where he is the, the co-founder and CTO. Here we go. And uh, thank you for joining us. And without taking any more of your time, uh, Jonathan is going to speak with us about uh, Datastack's Astra and Apache Cassandra. So take it away, Jonathan. Thanks so much, Rich. It's great to be back at ApacheCon. As a case study of how open source can succeed and thrive in the cloud era, I'm going to explain how Datastax built our Apache Cassandra service called Astra. Right now, companies are trying out uh, different approaches to building cloud services. I've picked a couple of well-known examples here. DynamoDB is an example of a classic closed source database as a service. You get the black box and it works or it doesn't. If it doesn't, too bad. Even if it does and you want to run it somewhere else, also too bad. Atlas is a database as a service built on a project that used to be open source. And by that, I mean a couple years ago, MongoDB famously changed their license from AGPL to a custom license called the server-side public license. This license attempts to force cloud vendors to open source any competing service they build, but in the process, it stopped being open source itself. We took a different approach with Astra. We wanted to build on the openness that's the default for Apache projects and bring back the improvements we made in the process of building Astra to all Cassandra users. We did that by turning our improvements into Cassandra Enhancement Proposals, or CEPs. The CEP is a process that the Cassandra community has defined to provide a process for discussing and creating significant new functionality. The first set of CEPs that we created were to lay the groundwork for running Cassandra as a multi-tenant service, which is something it wasn't really designed to do 10 years ago. This groundwork included a management API sidecar, a Kubernetes operator, and something we call guardrails. When Cassandra was born, the state of the art in infrastructure automation was configuration management tools like Puppet and Chef. Kubernetes was released only a few years after Cassandra, but support for stateful workloads like databases wasn't added until 2016, and then it took a couple more years to really be production ready. So when we broke ground on Astra, we had some work to do to build our Cassandra service on Kubernetes. Our first step was to make Cassandra easier to automate from any control plane. We open sourced a management API sidecar to provide higher level operational actions across a cluster. This gives us some version independence against the underlying Cassandra release, and it makes it easier to evolve the sidecar quickly. All of the operations on this slide are conceptually simple, but against a distributed system like Cassandra, that's dealing with multiple clients connected to it, as well as connections to other nodes in the cluster, the implementation isn't trivial. For example, shutting down gracefully means you need to first stop accepting new requests from clients, tell the rest of the cluster that you're going to shut down, finish existing client requests, and flush recent writes to disk so you don't need to replay the commit log on restart. So you have two complexities. One is the number of steps involved, but the other is that for these steps, you have to wait an unknown amount of time for something to finish. You can't just say, do this and, and then fire and forget those commands. You need to wait for the cluster to reach the next state that you wanted. So once we had uh, that, that management process, we needed to build the actual Kubernetes operator. The operator starts with provisioning and configuration management and continues to upgrades, backup and restore, scaling and failure recovery. Again, we needed this ourselves to run Cassandra and Astra, so we open sourced it and created a CEP to officially bring Kubernetes to the Apache Cassandra project in tree. 
The third thing we needed to do was give users less rope to hang themselves. And that's what we've called guardrails. Historically, Cassandra has targeted power users who want to push the limits and invest the time required to understand how to do that successfully. But the goal of a database as a service has to be that it just works. You shouldn't have to spend a lot of time reading manuals before making your first API call, and you certainly, certainly shouldn't be able to break it. So we needed to restrict some of Cassandra's traditional freedoms, as in the examples here. But again, these are also useful outside the cloud for traditional IT departments. So we created a CEP, a CEP to bring this to Cassandra as well in an opt-in fashion. So Cassandra will continue to work the way it always has out of the box, but if you choose to do so, you can enable some or all of these limits. We launched Astra as an open beta a year ago, and we quickly got feedback on features that users wanted to see in Astra and by extension in Cassandra itself. We created CEPs to add these to Cassandra as well. The first of these is already implemented and live, and that's storage attached indexes. There's a little bit of backstory here because Cassandra has had pluggable indexes since 2011. Making indexes pluggables uh, is, I think that's one of the things we got right. But it's still taken a long time for Cassandra indexes to match the flexibility and performance that most users expect when they're coming from a relational database background, which is most users. This graph shows the storage space required for creating 10 indexes against a base table. The base table space used is in gray and the default legacy Cassandra indexes are in green. Storage attached indexes are in blue. For those of you who follow Cassandra development, this also compares an experimental index implementation called SASE. You can see that the amount of just storage space used can be an obstacle to using indexes as freely as you'd want in Cassandra. And so that was one of the main design goals we had for SAI was solving that problem. The second design goal we had for SAI was increasing your flexibility you had to do queries. And so we achieved that as well. Because the index interface in Cassandra it has already been defined and because index semantics are relatively straightforward and uncontroversial, we went ahead and implemented SAI in Astra while starting the discussion on how to bring them to Apache Cassandra. So up to now, what I've present, presented is features that are done, they're live in Astra, and we've opened CEPs to bring them to Apache Cassandra as well. The next things I'm gonna talk about are things we learned Astra users want, but we need to build consensus with the Cassandra project on the right way to implement them before we start building them. The first two here are related. Cassandra's approach to data modeling since the beginning has been to encourage developers to denormalize their data at write time so that at query time, you can pull what you need from a single partition. But developers don't love that. Sometimes you just want to get something built quickly and optimize it later. And sometimes optimizing isn't even necessary, not even later. You have a table that just isn't queried very often, or it doesn't hold a lot of data. So we want to add joins to the Cassandra query language. And to do that, we're going to need a query planner. And that means that to understand what the planner comes up with, you're going to need explain syntax. So that's why these two go together. Again, uh, if you're familiar with Cassandra, uh, we've had something called tracing for a while that does something similar, but it's, it's very low level. Very, it's down in the weeds in terms of like, I scanned these data files and found the rows matching your query and I, scanning them took this long and merging them took this long and so forth. So the explain is, is going to give you something that's a little more human readable and, uh, and a lot more high level. The third thing that we're collaborating with the community to build is change data capture. 
Change data capture is different in that it affects less how you query Cassandra and more in how you build the rest of your data platform. CDC is useful for all Cassandra users, but it's especially useful for Cassandra users in the cloud where the expectation is that I should be able to wire together the services I need from a broad menu. So our motivation is pretty intense to give Astra users a CDC implementation that they can use to simplify their infrastructure. But again, we don't want this to be Astra only. We want to work together with the Cassandra project to make sure that we build something that works for everyone. So that's what we're doing in the C CEP process. So here's my recipe for building a win-win infrastructure as a service that's faithful to the open source principles of the community. Give users a choice, engage the community as early as possible, and share learnings as code. It sounds easy, but of course the devil's in the details. For example, you, I say to engage the community as early as possible, but sometimes as early as possible means you still end up where you need to ship something before the community arrives at consensus, and that can piss people off. It's a balance and we're not perfect but we're doing our best to contribute in good faith. In closing, I'll encourage you to give Astra a try right now. It's the easiest way to get started with Cassandra and there's a permanently free tier. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. This was great. And uh, thank you to all of our keynotes this morning.